Okay. Um, a friend recently recommend, recommended a book to me, and the title of the book is Anti-Fragile. And I've ordered it. I'm waiting to get it from Amazon. I'm looking forward to reading it. The first sentence in the prologue reads, Wind extinguishes a candle and energizes fire. And it's not a Christian book, but I think it's an intriguing sentence to start a book with. And I was thinking, how can moving air both extinguish and energize? In our worlds, how is it that one event smothers in one situation and in another situation fosters growth? When things happen in our life, wouldn't it be great if we could just grow and prosper without regard to the events in our life? Put another way, maybe uh, no matter what happens in our life, if you're anti-fragile, you rise, you grow, and you get stronger. And I'm pretty sure Jesus was anti-fragile. What was meant to end his influence grew it. What was meant to extinguish his followers' influence expanded it. That, of course, is the Holy Spirit. So how does this fire energize us? Let's look at some history and unpack what Dr. Luke wrote in Acts. In the Old Testament, the Spirit would come for a specific person to help them in a specific event or maybe even a smaller group of people to help them accomplish God's plan. Such is the case with Saul when he anointed David. First Samuel tells us that the Spirit of God came upon David and that he was filled with the Spirit from then on. The day of Pentecost was an annual festival celebrating the day after the seventh Sabbath, after Passover. In the 23rd chapter of Leviticus, it explains this festival. It says, From the day after the Sabbath, the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, count off seven full weeks. Count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath and then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. Pentecost is often called the festival of weeks due to the seven weeks from Passover. Pentecost simply means 50 days. The Festival of Weeks, or Pentecost, is a Jewish celebration and was celebrated as an offering to the Lord of the first fruits of the harvest. The New Testament day of Pentecost is significant because of the first fruits that Peter's sermon produced. The disciples were most likely gathered in the upper room where they had been gathering for the last several weeks. Now the text does not tell us exactly what they were doing, but if I had to guess... I would say they were praying. And the wind is a great analogy for the Spirit, and it has been connected to the dry bones story in Ezekiel and the discussion between Jesus and Nicodemus. Jesus compared the wind to the Holy Spirit. And we cannot see the Holy Spirit or touch it, but we can feel the Spirit. The noise that came with the tongues of fire was very loud, and the source of the noise was obvious. It came from heaven. The flames of tongues that came with the noise affected everybody present. They were all baptized in the Holy Spirit. So why did the Holy Spirit come as wind in tongues of flames? The tongues might symbolize speech and the communication of the gospel. The wind brings a change to the world. The winds of change still blow today and are changing the world all around us. Fire represents God's purifying presence. The fire burns away the undesirable elements in people's lives and sets the heart ablaze with a passion for sharing the gospel. John the Baptist proclaimed that the Holy Spirit would baptize with fire. The term or the concept of baptized in the Spirit occurs only a few times in the New Testament. It is used basically in three ways. Prophetically, the phrase is used in the Gospels. John the Baptist used the term in describing Jesus' ministry. Matthew 3.11 is where John the Baptist proclaims, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then in Mark 1.8 and Luke 3.16, tells us the same thing that Matthew 3.11 does. These are prophetic words that John is proclaiming. 
He is proclaiming that the winds of change are coming. Now in Mark 3.11, whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And the crying out of the phrase, You are the Son of God, is a prophetic statement made by the evil spirits proclaiming who Christ is. In Acts 1.5, Jesus quotes John's prophecy, looking forward to Pentecost, saying, For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit did come in a strong and powerful way and baptized them. Historically, in Acts 2, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit was initiated on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came to make the church His residence indwelling every believer. The church is the people of God, not buildings. In Acts eleven sixteen, the term is used by Peter when he is reporting to the church in Jerusalem, referring to Jesus' quote of John's prophecy. Paul teaches us about the doctrinal aspects of the day of Pentecost and the Spirit being available to all who trust Jesus as Lord and Savior. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Paul said, For we were all baptized in one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. On the day of Pentecost, God confirmed the presence of the Holy Spirit with fire that did not consume. This event certainly fulfilled John the Baptist's words about the Holy Spirit. All of the people present in the room that day were filled with the Holy Spirit and no one was excluded. They were filled with the Spirit to carry out the mission of God. But what about today? Are we filled with the Holy Spirit? Are we willing to allow the winds of change to dwell within us? In some Christian circles, the Holy Spirit is either neglected, forgotten, or misunderstood. The one given to unite the body of Christ is the center of controversy. So often, Christian work is so rigidly programmed that it seems we no, no longer need to depend on Jesus. And yet, Jesus did tell us, without me, you can do nothing. The late Dr. A.W. Tozer, author and pastor, said, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95 percent of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. The Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the early church in the New Testament church. 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. Perhaps we need to be on our knees praying for the winds of change to blow over us. Luke tells us that everyone present is filled with the Holy Spirit, and this filling is the baptism that John the Baptist told us about. This baptizing or filling of the Holy Spirit describes the act of receiving the Spirit and should be understood as the first occurrence of the Spirit indwelling the believer, meaning that this is the Spirit's initial work in the believer's life, and like water baptism, it only happens once. We must take advantage of that infilling and respond to the call on our lives. We must also understand that baptism of the Holy Spirit must be understood in the light of His total work in Christians. The Spirit marks the beginning of the Christian experience. No one belongs to Christ without the Spirit. No one is united to Christ without the Spirit. And no one is adopted as God's child without His Spirit. No one is in the body of Christ except by baptism in the Spirit. The Spirit is the power for the new life. He begins a lifelong process of change as believers, becoming more Christ-like. Those who receive Christ by faith begin an immediate, personal relationship with God. The Holy Spirit works in them to help them become like Christ. The Spirit unites the Christian community in Christ. The Holy Spirit can be experienced by all and He works through all. Our water baptism is the outward sign of the inward grace 
that the Spirit brings to us through the winds of change. The believers that were present on the day of Pentecost literally spoke in other languages, which is a miraculous thing and got the attention of those in the crowd that gathered. This was a time in the life of the church where it grew rapidly. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit gave the believers the ability to speak in other languages, allowing the gospel message to be heard by the international group that had been gathered for the feast. From the New Testament teachings, it is clear that the gifts of the Spirit are to be used to build up the church. Luke's record of the birth and early years of the church can be a little mind-boggling. Some Christians read about supernatural events like foreign languages spoken at Pentecost and wonder why doesn't God still do miracles like this? Sometimes in our desires to see signs and wonders, we forget about the miracle of a changed life. When an abusive father is genuinely transformed into a caring and gentle soul. Is that any less wonderful than seeing a crippled person walk? Which is more impressive long term, the sound of a mighty rushing wind coming upon a group of praying Christians once, or a self-centered woman changed into a compassionate servant who devotes the rest of her life to helping others? Don't downplay the significance of the winds of change that changes lives. This big of an event could not help but attract attention, and people would gather to see what was happening. Imagine a noise as loud as a freight train that came rushing through here, and flames began touching us. How many people in our community would want to know what was going on? If others came to this church, how would they know that we are different? It is by the winds of change that they would know that we are different. A large part of the people who had gathered were Jews from the diaspora. Diaspora simply means scattered about the world. They were in Jerusalem for the festivals. As the crowd gathered around the believers, they were astounded by the fact that they were hearing their native languages. In this passage, the Greek word for languages refers to an actual earthly language and not the type of tongues that Paul is referring to in 1 Corinthians. This gathering was the perfect platform for launching the international mission of the church. This powerful event told Jerusalem that the gospel was for all nations. The list of countries is where all of the Jews had come from. The countries are listed from east to west geographically. We're not sure why Luke listed them this way. But we do, do know that the believers, after the Holy Spirit's baptism, could speak languages from other nations. This allowed the visitors in Jerusalem to understand the powerful acts of God. And the content of these speeches were telling of the wonders of God. They were not telling people to repent. They were proclaiming the mighty acts of God. As some people think of the day of Pentecost as the Babel reversal. They think that God seems to be saying that I confused your language thousands of years ago in Babel and now on the day of Pentecost. I have an important, important message the whole world needs to know. Verses 12 and 13 show just how typical people can be. Some are perplexed and want to figure out what just happened and others simply mock the believers and say that they are drunk. When something miraculous happens today, do we become perplexed and try to figure out what has happened? Or do we speak up like Peter? The day of Pentecost was a huge opportunity for Peter. He jumps right in and preaches to the crowd. We can do the same thing when we have an opportunity to speak up. We can stand up and tell the gospel story. As a disciple, Peter was not the kind of guy that you would want to go to in the clutch. As a disciple, whenever he opened his mouth, it was usually to change feet. He was the one who, when the spotlight pointed his way, ended up embarrassing himself. On the day of Pentecost, a holy and historic moment in front of a large crowd, Peter had something to say. But would it be something appropriate, or would he be putting his feet in his mouth? His track record 
wasn't so good. Peter didn't have a history of rising to the occasion. I can just see the other disciples saying, Oh no, it's Peter. What's he going to say? But Peter said exactly what was needed. His powerful words pierced the hearts of the crowd. And Acts 2.41 says that those who accepted his message were added to their number that day. It was a defining moment of his ministry. In Acts, we see a new Peter. He has been forgiven and restored after denying that he knew Christ. Peter's boldness comes from the Holy Spirit's baptism of fire. We now see Peter as an apostle, and he understands what his new role is. He has been sent to proclaim the gospel. Peter begins his sermon by stating that they are not drunk because people typically don't drink at 9 a.m. in the morning. Peter quotes uh, Joel twenty eight thirty two, but he's referring to the dreams, the visions, and end times all brought on by the winds of change. Not all of Joel's prophecy is happening on the day of Pentecost. The sun turning to darkness and the blood-red moon are referring to the second coming of Christ. This part of prophecy is yet to be fulfilled. The Spirit is poured out, and the Spirit gives dreamers and visions to all people who put their trust and faith in Christ. Peter quoted all of Joel's prophecy on the day of Pentecost to get to the punchline. The punchline is verse 21, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter's telling the crowd that all who call on the name of the Lord is saved. If you read on in Acts 2, you read about Peter's message and 3,000 people come into a relationship with Jesus. The relationship that God has with the people of Israel continues, but it now has been expanded to include all nations and people. We have to call on the name of Jesus Christ for salvation. We have to believe that God's Son is the Messiah and allow the winds of change to blow through us. What happens on the New Testament day of Pentecost changes the world forever. The winds of change will breathe life into the church. The winds of change blows into dreamers and visionaries, giving them the dreams and visions to do new things for Christ. Ministries cannot become great without dreamers who Worry of only maintenance year in and year out. We need more dreamers and visionaries who have the creativity and tenacity to break with boredom and try the unusual. Will we allow the winds of change to give us the dreams, the visions, and the courage to do the unusual, the new things that will glorify God? Remember, Wind extinguishes a candle and energizes a fire. Will you be a fire for Christ, proclaiming the gospel? Amen.